Awesome. Okay, so it is four o'clock and welcome to a conversation around the power and the potential of storytelling in ways that storytelling can really be an amazing experience for not just students, but I think teachers as well, to just communicate and engage and to create moments of curiosity. And if you think about some of your favorite books or plays or live talks, so many of them have this storytelling mechanism that keeps you engaged, keeps you curious. And I wanna discuss different ways that I have seen it impactful in the classrooms that I have directly taught those students, as well as the different classrooms that I am just sort of a, an outside support or collaborator uh, with those educators that are that are charged with those students. So I'm gonna share this. This is this is my first office hours. So I'm gonna kind of feel the room. If there isn't enough conversation in the chat or on the microphones, which I'll just request that you you mute your mic unless you want to say something, uh, just for the the feedback um, issue. But basically. If we can create a conversation that's a little more dynamic, then we're going to go with it. It's going to be organic. It's going to be exciting. If I feel like there's this awkward silence for more than a minute, I'm just going to kick into pre full presentation mode because your time is valuable and I don't want to have you feeling like you came for something and you're not getting what you need. I'm ho I hope you came for storytelling because that's, uh, that's what the focus is today. So just uh, I'm going to share my screen just to kind of introduce myself in the context and a little bit about you know why I love storytelling while I'm doing that please use the chat to introduce yourself maybe what you what role you have in the school that you teach at what city what state what country you're based in it's always cool to see uh, the international audience that is is coming to these these different sessions with the uh Global Education Technology Academy. So awesome. Welcome, Alicia. She is based on New York science teacher. We have Melody, Alaska, an educator and an author, and also a friend of mine. So thank you for coming to check out the stories. So everyone else can, can share. I'm going to share my screen, and I am going to hopefully present this slideshow in some sort of normal normal way. Okay, so just real quick, if everyone can confirm that you can see my screen, that's always helpful. Because right now it's like pulsing red. Okay, you can see my screen, awesome. Okay, so <clears throat> I wanna give you a little bit of background some of the ways that storytelling has been really impactful with the students that I have been teaching over the past couple years. So I am going to share a lens of storytelling through startups, also through digital publishing, because I have some really great stories as well. And I'll, I'll sort of run around a couple different slide decks, just depending on just kind of how, how it flows. But the... Um, I think what's really important at the end of the day is we talk a lot about student voice, but it's important for our students to know they have a voice. They need to be aware of it. And when they share something that they're passionate about, when they share something that they care about and others connect with it, others are inspired or impressed by what they're sharing, that is what student voice is. So student voice isn't alone or exclusively just giving them the vehicle, but it's making sure that that vehicle gets somewhere. And I want to share a little bit about uh, me and the work that I'm doing and some other stories from different awesome moments over the years. I just finished my 11th year in teaching. Education is my second career. I started as a creative director, a designer. I taught higher ed design courses, and that's really what I thought I was going to do. And I fell in love with teaching because I was evaluated by my first couple classes. And those students said that I supported them and that I listened to them and that I, they felt that I was really focused on their success. And in the design world, you don't really get that kind of feedback. So it was, it was really like a invigorating moment. 
And fast forward now 11 years, I have been a director of education technology. I have been a graphic arts teacher and instructor. I am now a director of innovation. And then I'm also known as the tech rabbi. So I, up until you know three or so months ago, uh, February 25th was my last trip to connect with awesome educators and learn from them and share with them. I was actually fortunate to tour a school. This was at the idea, idea conference in Illinois. It was just super awesome. And I miss it. I miss connecting with educators. I'm grateful for moments like these because uh, although it's definitely a different experience than you know that face to face, it's it's awesome to connect. And as a director of innovation, I was recruited by the school to create an innovation department, an innovation lab, a, a STEAM experience. And I feel that one of the really great ways to connect all of these different skills and, and the knowledge and these abilities and these pieces of technology is to give them an awareness of the entrepreneurial possibilities. And it doesn't mean you're going to become an entrepreneur. It means that you understand what it takes. What is the, the journey? What's the workflow? What's the process to be effective at identifying problems and communicating those solutions that you come up with with others, creating those solutions and connecting with other people to get them inspired and interested. And that process can be broken apart and I think delivered in a pretty amazing way, even to younger students. I, I had a session on this actually with one of the ISTE affiliates, the Digital Storytelling Network. And I shared this and I was a little bit overwhelmed because I don't know if the entrepreneurial process always connects across all grade levels. So like if you're a second or third grade teacher, you know, what does an entrepreneurial experience look like? And I really tried to break it apart in ways to show the different, the different features, the different areas, the, the research at a third grade level, the empathy, the, the presentation skills, all of these are mechanisms that can lead you to being a really capable and successful adult. And the, the earlier we deliver those opportunities and create those experiences for the students, the better it's going to be. Uh, if you have any questions during the session, please share them. Have conversations in this. I love that I'm seeing so much conversation right now already, just people sharing and connecting, because uh, it's not just about you know this moment, it's about continuing this process throughout uh, the summer as we're connected, not just through these sessions. I have a bunch of sessions happening weekly in, uh, in, in, the, in this Microsoft um, you know, series of, of, of presentations, but also just connecting with people and, and sharing great ideas, I think on social media is just super awesome, super rad. So let's, let's move in. So you can scan this QR code if you want. QR code uh, does a couple things. One is it lets me share resources with you. Uh, it also lets you uh, get connected with me via uh, some of the work that I'm doing beyond this session. So you can feel free to scan this. I'll bring it up after the, the, the session as well. So don't feel like you have, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out if you didn't get the uh, didn't get the, the QR code right now. And it's cool to see uh, some returning uh, participants. I think I see one or two people that were in a session earlier. So that's cool that you came back. So thanks so much for that. So I want to I want to talk about a couple of things. I'm going to share a story first, and it's about an eighth grade student. It's a bright boy. And he is in a history class. I'm collaborating with the history teacher. We're trying to figure out ways that we can create a, a more just engaging, interesting experience for these students when they're learning about the Revolutionary War. And think about like a classic, and you know, you can change the Revolutionary War to any topic. What is like the classic sort of project activity for students? They they do research. They learn about something and then they present it. They present that information. And it's incredibly boring. It puts people to sleep. No one wants to sit through a five, 10, 15 minute presentation where there's PowerPoint slides and someone is just reading the slides to you. You know, it's, it's like if, if you have insomnia and you need to figure out how to go to sleep, attend one of those presentations. You will be sleeping, I promise you. 
So we're, we're trying to figure out like what, what could we do that would be a little different? So this group of, of students embarked on a pretty cool journey. It was definitely an experiment and it went like this. Let's create interactive books that showcase different events during the Revolutionary War. Let's have the students do first person writing. Let them do research into you know, various figures and important individuals that were connected to that specific event during the war. Let them create plays and act out, create video content that can be embedded in the book. And then let's add some audio so that we can get this sort of full range of experience through the different possibilities using Book Creator. And then at the end, the students had to create a series of questions that not only demonstrated that they understand the content, but that they crafted really great questions that if somebody consumed their content, they would be able to be assessed on it. So it's like a double, it's like a, it's like a win-win, right? It's, it's two levels where they're creating content, they're creating assessments, now they're being assessed. And we finished this process. We have a 112 page book on the Revolutionary War. It is one gig and we can't export it off the iPad. It's like, it's too big. So I, I reached out to Book Creator on Twitter. I was like, look, we got a problem. They helped me through it. There's a way to like decompress or lower the resolution on the videos. And we were able to get it into Google Drive and then download it onto all the other iPads so that they would be able to engage with their peers' content. So they finished, they finished the experience and this student says, is this going to be the Revolutionary War textbook for next year's eighth graders? And I was like, whoa, I never, I really never thought about that. And why didn't I ever think about that? It's because of a very interesting sort of thought. How often do we create experiences for our students that they are so passionate, that they're so proud of their work, that they would want other people to see it, other people to engage with it? I think it's just rare because I think that most of the time we're, we're so pressed for time that the destination for the work that our students do is our grade book. And that's where it is. And they want to know what their grade is. In middle school, they haven't yet been fully indoctrinated into the game of school. Not all of them anyway. So they're not like, you know, they're not like high school students. You know, my ninth, 10th, 11th graders, they're like, you know, what, <coughs> like, what can I do to get the A? What do you want? What do you, what's an A? I'm like, well, an A is when you do something that you're really passionate about and excited and you kind of go above and beyond and you create something that's interesting for others. Okay. So how do I get an A though, right? Like that's, that's the process. So with the pitching, I think this is really cool. I'm gonna talk about an elevator pitch. I'm gonna talk about this journey only because it's so fresh. I came to this school December, be three years ago this December. And they said, make an entrepreneurship program. And I was like, okay, no pressure. Let's do it. Let's create entrepreneurial experiences. And in February, I launched our first, sort of like Shark Tank, school-wide competition. I have courses, I have students enrolled in the courses, I meet with students at lunch. This was the first time that we opened it up to everybody, the entire school. And then the pandemic hit, so I didn't get a lot of responses. I was kind of bummed about it. And then I got seven. I was like, oh, thank God, I got seven. This is gonna be great. Three of them made to the finals. They had to create a startup idea that ran the whole gamut identifying problems, having empathy, doing first person research pr or primary research uh, by you know, surveying people, doing secondary research to understand the market, creating you know, market validation, competitive analysis, all these like really like complicated business things that they were just like rocking it. But it was the pitch, the presentation, the way that they had to engage three different startup experts, one of them, Mandela S.H. Dixon, who, uh, as I talk, I'm going to I'm going to put her her Twitter handle in the uh, in the session um, chat because she is incredibly inspiring. The, the work that she's doing, she has raised fifty 
million dollars for underserved founders, minority founders, in three years. So she's one of the one of the judges, uh, Dr. Charlie Miller, who many of you know if you if you've heard of Flipgrid before. A friend of mine, he was one of the judges, and then a friend of mine, Joe Teplo, his company got acquired by Salesforce. So these are these are business professionals, and they pitch, they present, they wow the they wow the the judges. But Mandela said something that I I'm just still like literally on on an educational high from. She said, "It is incredible what you have accomplished so early in your journey, and if you." If you're interested or if you try to advance this project, develop it further, and you're looking to raise capital, I hope you come to us before Shark Tank. Now, I, I, want, I want you to understand my perspective, but I want you to just think about it for yourself right now. Like, what does that mean? Share in the chat. Like, when you hear that, you have students that have come up with some sort of business idea to help others. They've pitched it to professionals and the response is like, you are so good that if you move this forward a little bit, you better call us before Shark Tank. Like, what, what does that mean when we're talking about storytelling? So I, I see one chat from Jennifer A, validation. Absolutely. These kids were on cloud nine. I was on cloud nine. Maybe they were on cloud 10. I was on cloud nine. Don't be shy. The chat is just one button away. I did ask a question. What was your what, question? <laughs> what, when you hear a response from a business professional to students that have pitched an idea, that have shared information, and they're being told, it's so good, you better come back to us before you try to go to Shark Tank, which is traditionally associated with like financial you know, business success. You know, what does that mean for students? So I'm seeing, you know, motivation, building confidence, validation. Yeah, so you could share more in the chat, but those, those are spot on. We need to give students more opportunities to feel validated and be motivated. And you can do that through the storytelling mechanism. So I shared the journey you know, the Entrepreneur Spark Studio, the work that I do, it gives them confidence. It gives them courage. And it's because they have developed two skills. And I realize you're kind of out of order, so pardon my jumble, but they learn how to speak and share information with clarity. And it's communicative. They share information and others understand it. Others connect with it. They relate to it. And it's super rad. So I, I said to these students, like, what makes a great pitch? I had to sit with them for hours and I'm mentoring them. I'm talking about the process of a hook and to share things that connect to your audience and understanding that one of the ways that's really helpful to build presentation skills, to build storytelling skills, is that you give students the flexibility or give them the, the chance to share things that they're passionate about. If you're having students share things that they're just learning about, maybe for the first time a couple weeks earlier, and now they have to present on it, that's a really hard way to build presentation skills. You want them to love what they're talking about. You want them to be passionate, maybe even a miniature expert. And I don't even know why I called it miniature. You know, you could be an expert. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you're passionate about something, you work hard in it, you can be an expert. So you could be, you know, 10 years old and know more about something and be a bigger expert than a 30, 40, 50, 60 year old. So it's important to give them that space. Now, someone said in the chat, you know, along the way, they must also have also learned that mistakes lead to answers, understanding better solutions. So students very rarely get opportunities to create and, 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 and share and reflect and refine the reflect and refine piece. I can't tell you how many students, I, I do a passion project at the end of my STEAM, uh, my STEAM ninth grade seminar, where they're just, it's just really to build their, their research and presentation skills. 
And the students that presented around gaming, I said, look, you don't get to play games like all day for your project. You have to come up with the way that you're going to share esports and gaming with an audience. And maybe your audience shouldn't be people just like you who love gaming. Maybe it should be your parents or somebody that questions why it's okay to spend five, six, seven hours a day or more on video games. So that's, that's something that I think is really cool. So what makes a great pitch? So I created this. I really got to push this out, push this out on, on social, uh, but I've been just kind of like decompressing it because it's actually – a process that I have now officially seen get to the level what I call ship it. And that's inspired by Seth Godin, who's an awesome marketer, is the ship it is you go through the process. You know what they need. They need a hook. They, they share through this process, and I'll break down the process a little bit. But the ship it means they get it out, and it goes somewhere. And I've had students present to their peers, I've had them present to faculty, I've even had them present to parents because my entrepreneur students present at our back to school uh, open house, you know, back to school night. And there's actually a picture. Let me see if I can pull this picture up because this would be super rad. This is like one of my, like literally, this is, I'm gonna share like one of the best photographs of my speaking career. So let me let me share this real quick before before I keep going. All right, hold on. This is this is like this is next this is next level, okay? I hope you think it's next level. I this this picture right here, this sparks joy, okay? Everyone sees everyone sees this picture. Okay? So this is a picture of a student that I've known since fifth grade. I taught at the K-8 uh, K school that he came to. I taught him sophomore year, junior year, and then this is his senior year. And what he's doing right now is he's pitching his startup idea to some prospective parents. And the level of joy, engagement, the captivation that you see in this picture, at least I see, it is just, it's just the next level joy. For a student to be able to share their idea, to share information, to share something that they're passionate about in a way that gets an adult like just grinning, smiling ear to ear. And, and his, the, his hands and his excitement. It's just like, I took this picture, I couldn't stop smiling. And every time I see it, I smile because this this kid's going places and it's definitely in part because of the processes, the entrepreneurial experiences that he received during that course. It got him to double down on his writing. I reached out once. There was a, there's a, there's this business, um, there's a businessman. He runs a sports memorabilia. <laughs> Uh, he, he joined. He, he runs a sports memorabilia company, and he says during um, you know on Twitter, he says, "Ask me anything." I was like, "Great." What is the single most important skill that a student in high school needs before they graduate right now? And he said, "Writing skills." He said, "Writing is the core to every skill that comes after that." So the speaking skills even the visual communication skills, the ability to put together information, package it, to send an email. It all starts with that writing skill set. And a lot of times our students are disconnected from writing because they're forced to write about things that they don't connect with. And I get it, the canon of literature. I'm not here to smash it. People think like, oh, you're always like making it, you know, taking a hit on, uh, on the canon of, of literature. And it's, it's half true. <laughs> It's half true, but it's what's really true is that there's room for more. There's room for elevator pitches. There's room to research how startups speak to investors, how people speak to their customers. How do you connect with people that you're trying to support? What does it look like to craft different types of forms of communication? 
So it's definitely, I think, a much needed update. So back to the uh, back to this pitch process, because I think the elevator pitch is a great activity that is really designed to give you like a micro dose of some new kind of interesting storytelling. Because, yeah, you know what? Like I did some really cool things with first and second and third graders. We took writer's workshop. If anyone uses writer's workshop uh, in the session right now, just give a thumbs up or a smiley face in the chat. So I'm a big fan of writer's workshop. I love writer's workshop because writer's workshop is super visual, right? They have to create that visual and then they have to work backwards and then build the writing through the context of the visual. So we said, well, what, why did we, what if we code the visual? What if we have these little, these little kids, first, second, third graders, you know, truth is, you know, I, I'm gonna have a second grader next year, my own, my own daughter. She's not so little. <laughs> so these kids creating a coded story in Scratch and then writing about it. Their writing flourished. They had so much to write about because they were able to create the experiences that they could then attribute those descriptive words in that process. So let's take science. We got Alicia in the chat over here. She's saying the challenge of connecting storytelling to science. And I think that what about having the students create experiences in science around their scientific research? Or what if we had students, I mean, depending on the grade level, maybe share the grade level you teach so that I, I don't wanna have somebody that's too elementary or too, you know, too high school level. But even having students create a storybook character of a cell, I know it sounds a little bit silly, but like the mitochondria having a conversation and then having everybody synthesize together the different cell characters to create the complete cell, I just think it's like a super rad idea. Um, you know, we had students using um, in middle school, so sixth and seventh grade, we had students using explain everything to create, I mean, depending on the science, this was actually uh, geology. Uh, unit for for middle school. So and this was this was sixth grade, and they were able to create these these really exciting stories of somebody traveling, um, you know, on on an outdoor journey, and they were getting to. I think that there was like topographic maps that they were discussing. They were discussing different rocks, and then my all time favorite, really, this is probably like a top five all time favorite assignment. Now, of course you have to travel for it. So it'd be cool to sort of have a conversation right now. You can hop on the, um, on the mic if you want uh, and share your thoughts. But we created a seventh grade science documentary because our, our students went on a science trip to upstate Washington. And we spent five days in uh, a series of different forests and mountain ranges. And it used to just be they would like fill in a, a notebook like taking notes on science experiments and observations. I was like, wow, that's super boring. Um, let's do something cool. So they made these five minute documentaries about different parts of uh, temperate rainforests and uh, Mile High Mountain Ridge and other types of rainforests and different environments and things that grow there and cool science experiments. So, you know, without traveling somewhere, you know, you could use some, you could use a Google, I don't they have Google tours of like outdoors, like forests. I know they have like, different historical monuments and different, you know, urban, um, cool urban like cityscapes. I don't know if they have like a Google forest uh, tr uh, trek, but you could use that. But they created these really powerful documentaries and it was all about storytelling. It was all about captivating the audience. So how do you go about that? So before I go about that, if anyone wants to hop on, ask some questions on the, on the chat, on the microphone, if you have a specific class, or a specific topic you'd, you'd love for me to brainstorm with you and with the group around storytelling, happy to do that. And as I said before, I got a slide deck ready, so I'll just move forward if uh, no one has any specific questions, but I love the questions. And I'm a huge fan of John Meehan. His book is super awesome, and everyone should follow him on, um, on Twitter. I'm gonna post his... Uh, Yeah, Adren Ed Adrenaline Rush is his book. 
Um, that's his Twitter handle, so you should connect with him. All right, so assuming that we have no questions, it's either because I'm super boring or because I'm No, so- you're not super boring. No, I actually wanted to say something about what you had just talked about with the science. Um, right. So I think I feel like it's really hard to get the storytelling in there, and I really like the ideas that you presented with, like, doing a documentary because um, a lot of times that's how scientists present their work to the wider public and I have a hard time getting students to do things like write in complete sentences and I don't even have parents saying why do they have to do that this is science class it's not English class and try, just trying to get them to understand that being able to uh, convey information to not only the wider public but to politicians and engineers so that we can have good laws so that we can have safe structures so I like the storytelling with that and I think that students a lot of times they find the topic of science to be so procedural and you always have to be so precise and and doing all of the math which is another language of science right so um I really I have never heard of bringing storytelling into my science class before but I can see how that I could get more student engagement out of that that's awesome I'm I'm thank you for sharing and I I think that it, it is hard even in my own courses, like I teach an elective. So that's even like, at least science is still kind of bundled into like the core curriculum. So in my elective course, my seniors, and it's mostly it's like, if you take my class as a senior, it's pretty clear that you just want to enjoy your senior year. But they were, they did major, major pushback around serious writing assignments, research writing, or, you know, it's full on script writing. And so I realized that one of the ways that I could sort of mirror the two is number one, if I could collaborate with the English teacher, so then I would try to do that. And if that's not always possible, or if it's only possible maybe for like one or two projects the whole year, then I go the bullet point route, which is create your bullet point journey, or you could have them do, you know, scraps of paper or post-it notes. I think, you know, post-it notes are a little overkill and kind of expensive, but you um, you have you have them write their you know th- these very simple thoughts uh, or bullet point style in a way that they could rearrange and create a sequence so that you could see what what are we going to talk about now for me you know I've been public speaking now um, for almost seven years so I can get up and I can just start talking. Now, I, I do that in certain settings, but 95% of the time I am preparing, even though I do this all the time. And that's because I'm constantly trying to refine the craft. Now, I might nerd out a little bit around the craft and speaking and this and that. Not everybody might be as excited about it, but I think that instead of doing full script writing, they could do bullet point writing and they can then start to have some structure to their talk so that they can be more effective and more concise because they know what's next. So even if they're not going to write out the full sentences, hopefully we can help them build the ability if they aren't yet comfortable speaking in not just full sentences, but in full thoughts, right? We know they can speak in full sentences, but it's a complete thought and being able to segue and move through that process. Um, Someone had mentioned... um, All right, so Padlet. Yeah, I have like a love-hate relationship. I was a huge fan of Padlet, and then they went, they did a bait and switch with the premium versus freemium. So I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit bummed out uh, with that. And I haven't really found a perfect replacement. There is a platform that I'm exploring called Mural, uh, mural mural.co, and I really like that. And you can get a free account as an educator if you just show proof of proof of that. Um, Patty says, I find it so tedious. How can I make it more interesting for them? We're going on a virtual field trip, but I feel like I'm losing them because we already went through all the science of it. As an English teacher, I feel like I would like to go a little beyond. So I think that it would be cool to engage the students because they are trying to tell a story to other people, maybe other people that aren't in their class. I have a couple experiences over the years that have been incredibly impactful. And one of them is that same eighth grade history class created content after they learned about the Bill of Rights. 
they created content for a fifth grade unit that superficial, maybe it was like a one day discussion around the Bill of Rights because that fifth grade uh, curriculum is a little bit more broad and eighth grade was much, much deeper. It went through Revolutionary War, it went through very key points in history. So they had to create content and they had to understand audience and they had to understand that fifth graders, you know, they know fifth graders don't know as much as eighth graders, but they had to basically create content that considered an audience and that meant that they had to create content in a more thoughtful way and they were engaged they were excited because they got to go into the fifth grade classroom and learn with the eighth uh, with the fifth graders the eighth graders and the fifth graders so they're sitting there and they're they're learning through these different videos and presentations and interactive books and it's just super incredible right there's other ways also to storytell you can see right here in this infographic I'm storytelling. You can go through this on your own and it kind of stands on its own. I don't necessarily need to explain it. I can give greater depth, but infographics are a way of visual storytelling. Someone in the in the chat, I love the idea of having them teach someone else. Feynman was a genius, but had the ability to explain particle physics to someone's grandma. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is like, being able to communicate information. I mean, I think parents now more than ever understand the art of teaching because they had to be kind of co-teachers in many cases. We have the ability to take information and package it in a way for somebody that doesn't have the experience or the broad understanding of that content. And there are plenty of professionals that are implementing what it is that we're talking about in teaching and they couldn't communicate, nor would they have the patience to try to communicate it to an eight-year-old, right? Or somebody who, you know, the, the age spectrum goes both ways. You know, trying to get, you know, my mother-in-law onto a Zoom call with her grandkids. So, you know, my, my fifth grade son, who's 10 years old, is, is, is coaching her through the process. So it doesn't matter age. It's really about expertise and then that ability to communicate information. Uh, what kind of feedback do you give students about the writing? It's not an English class yet. Clear communication requires proper spelling, grammar, and punctuation. So I'm a little bit more lenient. And I would be happy to share with the English teacher the writing capacity of their students so that they know what to work on outside of the context of maybe their own narrow vision of what is happening in the English classroom because like it's their room right you don't if, if you're in the if you're in the moment you don't see where everybody is at per se and so if you could share that information that data is super valuable so I would share that so I don't focus too much on the spelling or the the grammar things like that and like look there's autocorrect but I get like if you if you learn how to spell the wrong word right that's also problematic um so let's let's walk through this process here. And I, I love and I just want to thank everybody, not just for being here. I, I know that many of you are not in uh, Pacific Standard Time. So for some of you, it's later and I'm just excited, but I'm more excited in the conversations. I, I that's like my oxygen right now. And when I'm just presenting to a bunch of squares with initials in them, it, I'm trying to bring the energy right now. I hope I hope you feel the energy. But having these like really awesome conversations is what is super rad. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that and for being part of that. So th this is the process. So the first thing is the hook. How do you get somebody curious and exciting? And if you look at YouTube 101, if you look at any YouTuber who has made a name on YouTube about how to make a name on YouTube, they always talk about the hook. And you can even, if you watch some of my videos, which, you know, no pressure, but I'm just going to shamelessly plug my YouTube channel. I talk about creativity, entrepreneurship, different tech strategies and lesson ideas, a lot of focus on creativity tools that make everybody creative like Adobe. So they say, you know, you create the hook, like in this video, and you're gonna tell them exactly what's gonna happen right now. Think about your own storytelling process where you might consider in the hybrid model that is almost guaranteed to happen in the fall. How are you creating content? Are you creating video content and are you editing it and, and creating small videos that are consumable? Do students know exactly what they're gonna get in this video the moment that they turn it on? Or do you hook them around curiosity? 
What if? Do you know when? Starting with these sort of thought-provoking type conversations can, or, or, or like, you know, thought, yeah, whatever, thought-provoking, you know, introductions, that leads to excitement. That leads to curiosity. So you have the hook. And then share a little bit about yourself. Make it personal. And then sharing your experience. So that's why I love the elevator pitch versus like building presentation skills around things that they're not comfortable in, they're not experts in. So you have them talking about their experience. Like, yeah, you know what? I've been, you know, creating art or I've been playing video games or I've been playing sports, whatever it is, you know, for five years now. That's like a mini expert. And they go through this process of then connecting to the audience. So it's a two-way street. Creating a conversation is about connecting with people and getting them curious, getting them want to share, want to contribute, and then go through that process of engaging with them and really understanding them. So if it's a presentation and no one's talking to you, how well do you know your audience? You know, one of the things that I'm really blessed to do is, you know, I do professional development. I work with school districts all over the country. And I say to them, I need to just sit right now for the next half hour and listen. I want you to tell me the story of your faculty members. Because if I'm not creating the conversation, that inspiring keynote that then leads to meaningful hands-on workshops, that leads to teachers leaving with not just like exciting inspiration, but practical artifacts of either what a student could create or what they'd like to create to better support their students. So if I don't understand who they are, then I am not starting the story on the right foot because that's a story. It's the story of that school district and the way that they could evolve and better support and better serve their students. And they're always kind of caught off guard. I don't know why that's weird versus me just like sharing the same awesome educated by design keynote that I've delivered you know, 30, 40, 50 times already, it changes every, I, I don't think, if I would go back to the revision history of that slide deck, there's like 55 versions. I have 98 slides in the slide deck and I don't even share all 98 slides. But it's about understanding who it is that you're supporting. So get the students to really understand who their audience is and to connect with their audience and be engaged and maybe even inspired by their audience will lead them to creating better content. If they know that their audience is excited to learn from them. So how do we create those kinds of environments where we can create that, that culture in our classroom that we're excited to present and share information and that we know we're building skills. We know we're building research skills and communication skills. We know that we're building skills and trying to help somebody, you know, like a call to action actually help somebody act on what we're saying and, and do something about what we're saying. Like all these skills can be attached to almost any classroom at any grade level. So it's that connection. And then it leads to that ask, right? It leads to that process where they are developing the confidence to, to have a, some sort of charge, some sort of ask where, you know, in the case of my students, it's like, I teach high school students, so it's funding if they're trying to get their startup funded. It's employment if I'm helping them build a LinkedIn profile and they are trying to tell their story through writing, through the narrative of their, of their, of their, of their bio description, of their headline, where I tell them that it's not just enough to say you're a high school student, but you need to say an aspiring lawyer, an aspiring business person, whatever it is, there's really awesome ways to connect the students and the storytelling to some sort of action. And then of course, in the context of the elevator pitch, they have to be able to close it with some sort of, you know, with some sort of clarity, right? And one of the things that I think is a really great mechanism for the storytelling process is, you know, this connects to science. 
I feel like, I mean, I've done this in other classes as well. I've done this in the English classroom. I've done this in, you know, Judaic studies classrooms as well, is how can we get students to go through this process with whatever sort of like skill set, writing, communication that they're trying to go through? So someone said it looks like an engineering and design process. So it is. It's inspired. I created this framework uh, mostly because I'm just obsessed with alliteration uh, and also just I've been frustrated with how some of these really big idea frameworks are a little bit overwhelming for uh, high school students and for sure like elementary, middle school students. So it's inspired by like lean startup, agile, um, you know, process of, 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 of work, of business, design thinking. And also the engineering, the engineering, the discovery process. So being able to identify opportunities, you can have this happen in your humanities class, in your science class. I'd be as bold as to say this could happen in your math class. We're not talking about a four week project based learning experience. This could be something that is achieved in just a couple class periods. But the students identify some sort of opportunity. I remember once sitting in, I was mentoring a math teacher and they were doing parabolas. And it happened to be that this math classroom had a, a huge wall of windows on the second floor overlooking the basketball court. And I was watching a student during this math class. Uh, fortunately, they weren't in the math class. You know, one of those like, hey, I got to go to the bathroom and they go play basketball. She was playing basketball, shooting free throws shooting free throws and I'm looking and I'm watching five, six, seven, eight free throws. And I was like, whoa, that's crazy. That looks like a parabola. And this teacher is teaching parabolas on a whiteboard. And that's really boring. And you can see that it's boring because all the students are bored and they're not paying attention and they're trying to sneak a little look on their smartphone. H how could we create that? So you have this mindset and you empower your students to have this mindset where they're looking for opportunities, interesting ways. It doesn't have to all be on the teacher, interesting ways that students and you as well can find opportunities to support the way that learning merges with something in the world around them. I like the world around them, forget the real world. Like, oh, we're in the fake world and let's talk about the real world, which is like business and industry. Just the world around them, their perception, their reality. And then come up with a solution. Come up with a couple solutions. How could we, in the fall, giving them an opportunity, what are five ways that we could present information that could be interesting for you? And then try to figure out a plan. You know, we have lesson plans. We have, we have curriculum maps. Create a plan that takes that opportunity and the solution and implements it. And then how do they present the information? How do they share it? How do they collaborate and present together. You know, storytelling can happen in small groups. The break, I don't know who uses Zoom. I use Zoom a lot. I don't use Zoom for my Microsoft sessions, of course, because they have Teams and I love Teams. But I, I, I've been using Zoom for like four years now because of all the remote work that I was doing before pandemic land. And I love the breakout rooms. I love that I can throw students, especially introverted students, and I can give them guiding questions and they start telling the story. They start sharing the information. So we don't have to look at storytelling as this once upon a time with characters and this vast level of writing and character development. And there's analysis and there's, you know, the, you know, the, the, the story, the story peak and, 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 and all of that. So they, they can introduce it. They can share it. And this is one of the ways that, it just was super rad that like, you know, my students presented to business professionals. And although, you know, Charlie is in education and he is, is, a, is an amazing supporter of education, the fact that you could have Mandela, this business professional say, what she said was like, now, now my students are trying to have class with me in, in July. They're like, when are we meeting? I was like, school is over, I'd ha but I'm happy to meet with you because that's literally like, that's why I'm here because you want to have class that's not summer school in, in July. So, you know, they go through, they go through that process. Now, another really awesome way, I'm just going to pull another slide deck out. So let me just share this real quick. Another really great way to storytell. It's not just writing, it's audio. 
It's podcasting. And let me just open this. Okay, here we are. Right now, not, no, no, not screen one. All right, hold on. Sharing. Here, okay. Awesome. Okay. Everyone can see that over there with the smiling, smiling guy again. Awesome. Okay. So here's podcasting. Okay. Podcasting is a super awesome storytelling mechanism. And one of the really cool things that could happen is students building the storytelling process to create engaging audio content, 10, 15 minute podcast interview getting students to connect to people that might be related to the classroom. Now I know for history, that'll be a little difficult, but for the English class, one of the coolest assignments or the coolest experiences that I created in the English classroom was actually bringing a copywriter into a classroom that I was supporting at my, my, my uh, children's school. And we ran a, it was once a week for one period. So it was a four week, four, you know, four class series on copywriting, sharing information. Basically everybody was given some sort of context, some sort of picture, and they all had to create some sort of story around that limited context that was shared on the, on the projector. And the students loved it. So could you have students in an English class interviewing writers interviewing copywriters, authors, people that write for a living so that they could share insights? Could you, in the science classroom, interview scientists? In the math classroom, could you interview data scientists or mathematicians? Have the students interview people. So the Beyond the Test podcast, I really got to reach out to this student. He just graduated. I want to see what he wants to do. Does he want to reboot it? Should I reband it? Should I come up with another student? But this student basically said to me, Rabbi Cohen, I have had enough of your podcast promotion. You keep talking about podcasts, this podcast, that podcast. We don't connect to, you know, business and marketing podcasts. We don't know if we're, what we're into. And I said, well, why don't you make a podcast about what students should know, what students should be into? And that's how the Beyond the Test podcast was born. And this podcast, eight episodes. In the beginning, it was my podcast. In the end, it was his podcast. And you see through the different episodes, interviewing authors, comic book artists, owners of esports leagues and NBA teams, the chief evangelist for Alexa. We interviewed all of these different people, and they all had amazing stories to tell. But the stories were crafted by the questions and the conversation that was driven by the student who launched this his junior year of high school. And as Jennifer mentioned in the chat, Twitter is a great place for subject matter experts. 100%. I'm going to tell you something funny. I'm blessed to have a very large community that I'm connected to on Twitter. No one wants to give me the time of day until I say, hey, a student, right? I put, out a, I put out a tweet. I'm looking for incredible women that are disrupting the startup industry, the startup scene. I have a student entrepreneurship competition. And I had like 40 recommendations in one hour. I've, I've never had a tweet. Like, look, I've had retweets. I've never had a conversation that intense and intense in a positive way, just like, full of conversation in just a few short hours. People want to give. They want to give back when students are the recipient. They, they make time. They clear their schedule. And it's super awesome. So I literally just went on Twitter and I reached out to people that I we, we researched. I had this student research. Who, who's an expert in the esports industry? Who's an expert in marketing? Who's, ex, who's an expert in this and that? And he found people. And then we reached out to them and some responded and some didn't and some responded and we never made it happen, but we got eight, eight episodes. You can actually scan this QR code 
and you can check out the episodes on iTunes. So it was super rad. It was super rad. And yeah, someone says some TV series have eight or few in a season. Yeah. I mean, look, it took it. We, we batched them. We released them. You know, we recorded them all like four or five episodes. Um, it was like, I think we did, we did three, uh, three episodes, then five batched. And then we released them each week just to like offset the burden. And then of course, the game of school. So even though it's beyond the test, the game of school is like, okay, got to do ACTs, SATs. I got to work on that college, you know, prep, everything, this and that. So he, he, he had to pause it, but um, I want to, I want to bring it back anyway. So, you know, these are, these are just some of the ways through, through, through startups, through, you know, even empathy mapping, right? Check this out. Um, you have students doing observations and then writing stories about that. There's just like really cool ways to get students to observe the world around them and write about it. Write about things they care about. You know, when an eighth grader tells me I hated writing until I got to write about horses because I love horses. I'm like, what are we doing to these kids? You know, and then some students get to, you know, during a live read aloud of Beowulf thrive and might not necessarily want to write about Beowulf, but they became Beowulf and they need to pursue an acting career because they're a dynamic, engaging and animated. So there are ways to do this through the lens of entrepreneurship and the startup process with elevator pitches, with startup pitches, you know, making you know, having have students create a TED talk. I have an assignment with my with my STEAM and innovation course for freshmen. So they start the year with an innovation research paper where they have to find a TED talk that's usually a subject matter expert that inspires them, that they're curious about. And then they have to write about and analyze their talk and what made it a, an incredible talk, what inspired them. And now I actually have a new version of that. Uh, that I'm working on a lesson right now this summer where they're going to actually create a TED talk, a mini TED talk, like a five minute TED talk around things that they're passionate about. So these are, you know, these are things that I'm doing and I hope that those were valuable to you and that you had some interesting, you know, thoughts running through your head as I was sharing those. But I also want to thank you for all of the really amazing conversations and, and the thoughts that, that were shared. So uh, stay tuned for the uh, for that lesson. I'm, I'm, I'm working right now on a project with Adobe and I'm creating that lesson for their master teacher program. And so you should uh, stay tuned on Twitter. If we're not, I, I'm assuming we're connected on some social stream, but if we're not, please connect with me. And then, you know, just scan this QR code if you'd like. It gets you connected to my content. It gets you connected to me. And uh, I get to share things that I think are valuable. And I hope that you're excited about the storytelling possibility now that we've had this conversation. So thank you everybody for being part of it. I really wanna thank those that contributed in the chat and I hope to connect. And I'll be giving basically, I think every week, sometimes twice a week, all the way through the summer, I'm gonna be talking about building presentation skills, creating amazing presentations, ways to do, next week is storytelling with the Sway platform, which is a really cool visual presentation software. And yeah, I'm just excited. So I'm, I'm glad I surprised you and I'm, I'm glad that you, you stayed and contributed, Alicia. I'm just, you know, I'm trying to make these interesting. And I hope that everyone is, is excited for the, for the possibilities. So thanks again.